Hello and welcome to The Caring View. No, do not check your clocks. This is not a live episode. This is going to be the first in a series of um, informative episodes all around the Provider Information Return, the PIR. Um, so this is going to be available on our usual podcast channel. It will be available on YouTube and we'll be sharing it across our social medias as well. So don't forget to subscribe to YouTube, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, um, and go and search out our podcast and you'll be able to access it there. Um, I am Adam Pennell, one of the hosts and founders of The Caring View, and I'm joined by my co-host today, Mark Tops, and our very special guest, Tracy Clark. Um, so I'm just going to come in and say hello both, um, and how are you both? Great, thank you very much. Yes, I'm good, thank you very much. How are you? I'm I'm good, I'm good. It's it's nice to do a, a pre-record, you know, it's the, the pressure of live television has taken off us. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, um, we, we can make mistakes, we can uh, go and touch up. Obviously we won't because we're the utmost of professionals. Um, so, like I say, this is going to be a, an informative session around uh, the PIR and the provider information return. Um, and although Mark and I have experience in this, we've both been registered management before, we've both run care services, um, we both still have a hand in, in providing support on PIRs, be that Mark in his regional role, myself in my consultancy. Um, but Tracy, you really are the expert here. So for those watching, those listening, um, they may not know what a PIR is. Please tell us what is the provider information return? It's, it really is. It's, it's a document with lots of questions um, and it's something that uh, the CQC will request um, usually typically before an initial interview um, after uh, some, uh, you know, a company's put in their uh, submission to the CQC. Um, and it's, it's, it's what's usually requested throughout throughout the year as well, usually just once a year. I think we're still yet to find out how they're going to use it when we move over to the single assessment um, framework. So basically, it's it's just a whole host of questions to get, um, I would say, a bird's eye view of what's happening now. And they will ask questions with regards to all sorts of safeguarding issues, you know, recruitment, all sorts of things, you know, over the last 12 months. So it's it's really it's asking the, uh, the company to be as open and as tra transparent as they possibly can um and to give them a you know a, a snapshot oh well i'm so glad i asked you to introduce the show today because i would not have been able to do that justice so before we get into the nitty-gritty before we get into this full-blown conversation your top tips and, and guidance on the pir who are you tracy tell our viewers tell our listeners just who exactly are you and what you do okay um i'm tracy clark and i run a company called virtual administration and we've been going 17 years this January. And basically what we started out, we are, we're a virtual PA company that provides admin support to uh, brain injury case managers, domiciliary care and independent therapists. So we sit within health. Um, and we started looking at the CQC about three years ago and realised that it's an area that's extremely admin heavy. The amount of paperwork that's involved is ginormous. So we, we we provide the support to registered managers in right from the beginning, hand holding them, walking walking them through uh, the registration process, helping them through the PIR, getting them ready for the initial uh, interview, right through to to getting inspected. So it's um it's a full blown um you know um the admin side of it and, and helping them get ready, be confident and evidence-based ready for the inspection. Thank you very much. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of managers on some of the Facebook groups um, message and say that their PIR has landed in their email, lots of questions about different parts of the PIR and a lot of kind of people dreading it. Um, but. I think we should flip it on the head and change the narrative that actually it's not something to dread. It's a real opportunity for you to showcase all that you do, the strength of your team and the impact that you're having on the people that you're supporting. Yeah. So Tracy, are you able to set the scene? So are you able just to kind of introduce the PIR, the purpose for the regulator in preparation for inspections? Because that's obviously what it was originally intended for. 
Yeah, I, I mean, following from what you you said there, it is it, it's it's giving the the registered manager of the company um, the opportunity to shine. You know, to really give a a really good you know um, outlay of of what's happened over the last with you know last twelve months because usually once a year. Um, just to explain, you know, the good stuff, everything that's been happening. Um, explain what the barriers are you know for example recruiting you know getting more carers in it's it's to go through all the different questions that they are that the, the the cqc will want to ask because if you think about it the cqc will do a, a really deep dive um you know as in um online looking at all the social media and everything but they'll want to know the other nitty-gritty stuff that you're going to be able to tell them by answering all these questions. And the biggest thing I'll say to anybody is when they've got a PIR form to fill in is not to panic. Don't rush it. Don't see it as such a big monster. And, you know, if you, if it's just you, but if you've got some team members, get the help of these other team members to fill out some of the questions. You've got to remember the registered manager doesn't can't know everything. So you use your team to, you know, pull this amazing information or this evidence that you're gathering to fill out this really good good document. Thank you very much for that. Adam. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I will jump. I don't, I, I don't go live. I don't go live, and I never, I, I never have hiccups when I go live. <laughs> Could I unmute just then? Could I unmute? So, I mean, really great insight, that Tracy, into the PIR. So, I mean, first things first. Um, before I just ask for your top tips, should we also just quickly dispel a myth? Because once upon a day, once you logged into your emails, and bam, there it was, PIR. That was the calling card. That meant they were coming. They were on their way. You know, the trumpets were sounding. The boots were on. They were marching. And CQC were going to come and storm down your door and rip you to shreds. That's not the case anymore, is it, the PIR? How often do we get it now? Well, from from what I'm understanding, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm looking, gonna look into the future. I'm gonna be looking more at, for, for next year with the the single assessment framework. And from what I'm understanding, they're wanting to come away from this, you know, yearly inspection. And if you come away after your yearly inspection with a good or an outstanding rating, you can pretty much think, well, that's me done for another couple of years. And, you know, unless anything happens. But I think with a single assessment framework, they're going to be wanting to have a lot more hands on, a lot more regular input. So it won't be just about an inspection as in somebody coming to your premises. I think it'll be a lot more. Uh, Zoom calls, phone calls, a lot more building of a relationship with, you know, with the inspection team. So now whether they send out a PIR form at the beginning of every touch point. So let's say, for example, we've got a year and they want to have a touch point, say, every three or four months, whether they decide that they're going to send a PIR out before that. I don't know. I think we're still to find out. I think we're still. I think they're still kind of possibly finding their way and they're going to be rolling it out. So I think it's going to be interesting to see. Definitely. And, you know, the single uh, single assessment framework is something that's so new to everyone that way. We're, we're all still yeah. in the I'm sure. But, I mean, if you get your PIR yeah. at the moment, it definitely doesn't mean inspection. It's on an annual sort of registration date basis, isn't it? So top tips, Tracy. Yes tips for completing the PIR. Yeah. We're going to go into it into more depth, but just a handful of tips you can give us. Yeah. Okay, first of all, don't panic. Um, don't rush it, most definitely don't rush it. And as I've said before, you know, there's a lot of questions on there. Um, break it down into chunks. Don't think you've got to fill it out all in one evening. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's so many questions on there. Decide, you know, you're just gonna do a few this afternoon. Get other team members. If you've got other team members, senior team members in your organization, get them to help you as well. You know, it's not just you filling it in. Um, you know, see what other kind of input you can get from other team members in able to, you know, answer some of the questions. And remember as well, it's 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 all about your evidence. You know, the evidence that you're constantly collecting over the over the year. One of the things I always say to everybody that I work with is have a, a folder that sits on your desktop, 
and within that folder have you know a folder for safe effective care and responsive and well-led and get into some form of discipline of every single day just putting stuff in this folder we all get so many emails with whether it's regard you know a, a, a lovely uh, email from a family member get that in there in that folder you know it's all about your comments training supervision you know team meetings care plan risk all this information this valid evidence get all that information collected because it'll all be massively useful when you come to wanting to fill out this PIR form. I think there's some really good tips there. And I, yeah, I think having something on your desktop or on a cloud-based system, just in case for whatever reason, your computer decides to go wrong, like mine did yesterday and you lose everything, but it just allows you to collect evidence as you go. Because I think sometimes you get the PIR annually and trying to reflect back over the last kind of 12 months, you obviously miss a yeah. lot of things. Whereas actually, if you're collecting it as you go, it just means you're collecting that evidence, yeah. you've got it. If somebody then does come and announce the inspection wise, then at least then you've got those, those documents to hand. Yeah. So we touched very briefly earlier about the CQC not spending as much time as they once would have done in services. So I remember Kind of they used to spend kind of a day or two days at least and obviously things are now a lot more intelligence driven reliant on kind of technology yeah. and data um, and inspections are going to be a lot more targeted and focused um, so anyone thinking that the pr is a quick fix they can fill in the boxes um, send it back we know that registered managers are really busy they've got 101 things that they need to do what would you say to any managers just think oh i'm just going to quickly fill this in send it back cross it off my to-do list I think you've got to, you, if, if that's what that's come in your inbox, I think you've got to look at your diary and put some time aside. Don't just think it's something that I can do in an hour at the end of the day when you're absolutely worn out, tearing your hair out or, or, or whatever situation is of that day. Actually put some time in your diary, block out half a day in your diary and sit and, you know, get somebody else in the office to take your phone to check your emails, actually pro put some proper time down. Um and read through all the questions. What I always say with any form, that kind of a form, read through all the read through the whole document first. And it's amazing when you start reading through that document because you you were thinking, oh geez, you know what they're going to be asking me now. But I would imagine a lot of a lot of you, you'll read through that document and you'll get to the end and you'll think, oh actually, it's not as bad as I thought. I can answer pretty much all of those. I'm I'm going to be all right. So when you've once read through that document, just, you know, print it off and put a load of notes on it and make sure that you highlight the boxes that you, you just think, I'm not going to be able to answer that. I can't. I just can't answer that today and just make a note of it and then block out some time in your diary again and get yourself ready for those questions that you're not sure about yet. And again, go through all your evidence and, and speak to, you know, we we all we all live in a huge massive grapevine. I would imagine all care homes, domiciliary care companies, case management, whoever you are, you're all going to have colleagues, friends that are going through the same thing, you know. So it's about talking to your peer group. You know, you may even have a a mentor that you can speak to. But speak to other people that's going through it. You know, pick people's brains. There's nothing wrong with reaching out and saying. Oh, I've got this for what did you do? What did you, you know, how did you fill it in last, you know, last time? So don't don't feel that you're on your own. You know, that's that's how I would answer that one. Honestly, thank you so much, Tracy. Now, so for those who don't know, the PIR is now an online document. So you get a, a web link to go to it and you go online and it's cloud-based and you can go back and forth as often as you like, but you've actually got to put something in those boxes to be able to progress forward. So whenever I do it, I usually go blah, 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 next box, blah, 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 next box. And I can fast forward all the way through and just remind myself what's coming. But it is broken down into sections and I'm going to start obviously with section one. So section one of the PIR is successes and barriers to care. Um, now, I get the good question here. So the first one is, the first question in the PIR is, describe what is going well and the impact this is having on people using your services. Um, so what tips can you provide to managers and proprietors who are filling in this PIR for the first time, for the 13th time? Um, mm -hmm. what, what should they be looking at, at putting in this section? 
Absolutely. I I think it's, it's it's funny when when I've done this with people before, I've gone through this form with different people before, different register managers, and they're kind of like, they're kind of like they, they have to think about it. The kind of like mind goes blank. So what's the best? What I I give them kind of like hints. So I would say obviously your obvious ones is your feedback forms. You know, if you do um, an annual feedback form to your your clients, family members, your carers, support workers, any stakeholders, you know, get all this information. So that's your obvious ones, any feedback and your emails as well. You know, I can guarantee you will get emails from from some from people from you know all different people that are kind of either clients or support workers saying you know giving you some good really nice comments use them as well most definitely but think about other stuff as well think about things a bit differently so you might have just recently um introduced uh, an online system you might have just recently brought in um let's say uh, a new invoicing system you've introduced you've introduced uh zero or quickbooks um and it's gone really well and it's made everything super efficient everything fast and and the first time you did the invoices it went really well and so i mean it's stuff like that that's it's positive it's it, it's it's a good it's a good news story it's a good news thing to talk about and what about recruitment session recruiting support workers staff members is damned hard it is so hard so if you've just recently in the last two or three months had a really good recruitment session and you've been able to take three people on then that's a that's a goal that's a really positive tell them about it you know explain what happened you know what it's a good result and the same with supervision sessions if you've had a really positive great supervision session with a team member you know showing really out say the the team member's been working with somebody and they've had some fantastic outcomes you know the, this client's been able to really hit its goals then shout about it because that's what it's about you know you're wanting to show the positives it's it's not just about the running of the business which is massively important but it's it's the clients as well so if you can show you know the impact that it's having on the clients their family members as well get it down on that paper you know on the online form fill it in yeah i suppose it's something around just remembering not to put down i hired three members of staff because i did this and it was fantastic it'd be a case of I hired three new members of staff through this new service I implemented, which yeah. meant that I could provide continuity of care for such and such a person because this was their journey and this is how it benefited their life. And it really is that impact focus part, isn't it, that they need to be focusing on now? You're dead right, because you're absolutely right with that, because with a single assessment framework, they're talking about the we statement. So it's not about you, I, I, I do this. It's it's what you you did, we did as a company and the impact it has. So absolutely, definitely. Thank you very much. So the second question on the PIR is describing the barriers that you are currently facing um, that make it difficult to provide a good quality care to the people using your service. I think this is a really good question because it allows managers to reflect on what hasn't been easy and what barriers are still in place. You know, the obvious one that we'd all straight away think about is the pandemic. So aside from that, what other things would you recommend, um, Tracy, that managers are documenting in their PIR as barriers? And should they be looking to identify how they'd overcome these barriers at the same time in this section? I think absolutely. If you're going to mention any kind of barrier that you've that you've had to deal with, um, you should always have um, a way of being able to document the solution um, and show it in a good light. Um, but even if you've had obstacles, I don't think there's, you know, the CQC will never, you know, they're not going to shout at you for if there's been obstacles in the way they're going to be more interested in how you overcame them, what you put in place to make sure, you know, it runs smoothly afterwards or it stops something from happening again. Um, I think that's the biggest um, thing I can take away from that. But as in with regards to, you know, obviously, apart from the pandemic, I would imagine the biggest barrier to everybody, and, you know, we're all talking about it in the news, is, is the recruitment side, you know, finding really good, reliable carers, support workers. Um, I think that's going to be and is, is the biggest barrier um, to absolutely everything. Um, and I think other barriers, I suppose I kind of like showed the positives, but I can kind of like put it on a 
on a flip side as well is, you know, the CQC are wanting, you know, everybody to go more online with their systems come away from being paper based. Well, if you're an organization that's been paper based forever, um, and all of a sudden you're after going online and you're, you know, you're not so fantastically au fait with technology and everything, that can be a barrier, it can be a barrier because, you know, you're having to do all this training, you have to train other people up in your office. Um, you know, give an example, you might have somebody that in the team in the team that's got dyslexia. You know, how are you going to overcome that, bringing an OT to help, you know, put in some systems or further training? It's all these kind of things that are perfectly fine to mention, but then put a good spin on it that, you know, what you've done to overcome these things and turn it into a positive. I wonder, sorry, Mark. Okay. I was just going to say, I wonder whether there's um, a, a, a position for us when we fill this part of the PIR in to go, actually, one of the barriers to good care for us is availability of medicines for the people that we're supporting. Now, this isn't down to us ordering them, but it's down to the pharmacy not having them or the GPs not prescribing them and actually pointing out external factors within the yep. same sector you know because social care usually gets the, the hands slapped actually if we if we move backwards and go health aren't supporting us here which is providing a barrier here we're safeguarding it to an extent but we need external third party support throughout the health and social care sector put it in because it shows you have an understanding of the system-wide approaches and and joined up working doesn't it it does yeah it really no. does and I think that's a really good point, Adam. And I think as well, you know, we've got the cost of living crisis at the moment. And actually, if you're having a struggle with local authority uplifting fees and that's knocking on to different bits and pieces because your staff have had pay rises or you've introduced, you know, things to help retain your team, then actually put them in. You know, if you've actually had to cut down on the fuel because of that, then make sure you document it. And I think when I was a manager, I think one thing that one of my inspectors always wanted was an action plan of what the issue was what it looked like, what you'd done and what the outcome was. And actually, it's a really good time to actually, if you don't have one of them, implement it. But also, if you do have that, sharing that alongside when you email that PIR back, you can then attach that action plan of things. So it's a visual for the CQC to see kind of lessons learned and actually that you are you are identifying that there are issues and what you're doing about them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And Depending on when you're watching this, the cost of living crisis is is super important because we're now proposing a, a, a national living wage of ten pound forty, which I, I know a lot of small care providers are probably trembling at the prospect of. So uh, yes, really good point about bringing up the, the cost of living mark. So if we fly over now to um, section two, now I think it's five hundred words a point, isn't it, on on the PIR from what you can put in. So you know, there's a five hundred word input um, in these sections, which you know sounds like a lot but once you really start putting your fingers onto your keyboard putting your pen to paper you know dipping your quill in your ink those words go really really quickly because you'll realize how awesome you are and how much you want to show off but section two is all about the people who use our services so 2.1 to 2.9 are all pretty self-explanatory from the pir itself but do you have any tips around them I would I would say be honest, you know that, that's that's the bit you know be honest and transparent. That's the biggest thing that I'll definitely say, you know even down to those questions where you know it asks, you know on serving notice to any carers, team members, and the other way around when you've had to give notice as well. Is it, the biggest thing that it is keeping really good records. You know when somebody if somebody's you've had to let somebody go because of an incident could have been a safeguarding incident you know make sure that you tie all ends up gaps up you know don't let things go on a a, a bad note you know it's it's really it's making sure you've got all your paper trail in place all that side of things and clearly explain everything you know read your information that you are going to provide to the cqc and um, make sure it all matches up and, it, and it's very clear um so that's one of the the, the things that I, I can bring to to that side of things most definitely and i think one thing from experience is always be honest you know not everything is good in your service there are things that are out of your control there's some things in your control and not everything runs smoothly we all know that working in social care 
And actually, Adam and I have been doing some work around CV and tips and bits and pieces. And actually, it's the same as the CV. If you put something in your CV, when you go for an interview, you're likely to be asked about it. So if you're putting something in your PIR that isn't accurate, you can bet your hell of your chances that it's going to come up in the inspection. So yep. 2.10 is around the restriction and the use of restraints, which I know from experience managing care services is often overlooked. Um, I think quite often we do things that are restraints that we don't necessarily see them as such. So perhaps, you know, bed rails, for example, is a huge restraint um, to somebody, but not something that we would necessarily thinking about. So alongside obviously this webinar there is the cqc pir guidance as well and we will share the link in the comments and bits and pieces in a second um but i was looking through the cqc guidance and i think there's actually some really great tips on this um and it is focused around stopping people going out due to their safety down to accompanying somebody when they go out which again i don't think you would necessarily think about um, if you've had to take something away from the environment that could cause them harm, such as medication, um, any restrictions that are imposed on them, such as visiting or family and friends visiting. And obviously, we know that at the moment, definitely in care homes, depending on when you're watching this, that actually, you know, the guidance at the moment for care homes is that restrictions are in place, especially if there's kind of outbreaks. So all those things you need to obviously bear in mind, um, things like sedating, medications, they're all restraints. So Tracy, what top tips do you have for this section? Um, and also, if why people are completing their PIR, they realise that actually they're doing something classed as a restraint or a restriction, should they be updating the care plan and risk assessment and then filling in the PIR? Or should they be just putting in the PIR, identifying there and then that they've realised and then going back to the care plan and being open and transparent? I would say the latter, what you've just said there complete that pay at PIR in as in today, as in you're doing it today, and then show that, you know, that you've, you know, you've realised um, that there is something there that, you know, they're describing as restraint and it wasn't something that you initially thought was. So again, it's that being honest and transparent and then update your risk assessment and your care plan and show the CQC that this is what you've done, you know, um, and if it's something as well um, that needs to be shared with, you know, the team that's going to have an impact on team, make sure the, the, the team are, are made aware of it. So it's not just in, in the silo, it's it's shared with everybody else. Um, again, it's, it's, it's just down to, to, to basic honesty. Um, we're not all walking encyclopedias um, and we're all very human. So like what you've just said with regards to restraints, with kind of, you know, the, the sides of a, a bed, um, putting a seatbelt on, all these things um, that we just take for granted, but could they be classed as restraint? Um, so, yeah, just be honest. Uh, but don't do, don't kind of like, you know, try and cover it up by changing the care plan before, you know, do that afterwards, you know, be honest. And then show that you've you've made the changes. Don't don't make anything so that it could easily be covered up and then found out later. Yeah, and that's you know that's always the temptation, isn't it? You know, is trying to um, reactively change things. Um, it, it can get quite difficult. So we did an episode recently around. Um, I say recently, it's probably the beginning of this year now. Mark, it's gone so fast around accessible information now. If you say AIS to uh, anyone in, in social care, they probably go, I have no idea, I don't know. And they don't realize actually a lot of the stuff they do is around the accessible information standard without them even knowing it. So Tracy, 2.13 of the PIR all around AIS, what should people be thinking about in their services? What might they be doing already that they don't actually consider to be accessible information um, standard compliant? And what other things should they be looking at um, into uh, including here or actually implementing within their services if they don't do it? Well, I think when, when people think of accessible information, the automatic thing is, oh, well, I better make sure I've got things available in, in larger print. Um, or, you know, if you've got um, clients that have, have got a sensory issue, you know, Braille, uh, yeah, colour, all that side of things. But I think there's other areas as well. Um, you may have clients where English is, is their second language. So, the you know, 
is it a situation where you may need to bring a translator in? Um, especially if you've got a client um, uh, where potentially it could be a, a client that's uh, had, a, had a brain injury and it's going through a, a claim through the court um, and there's your deputy involved and solicitor and all that side of things then if you've got a client that's the english is their second language then yeah definitely um introducing translators will most certainly help but on a on a more basic basic level um i would say the paper-based side of things um it's easier i always think it's it's it is easier to show um a client um their care plan in, in paper form whether it's in a folder, you know, they can read it, they can pick up the piece of paper, yeah, make it large print if necessary. But I would imagine some people be, you know, we're, we're being asked to move on to an online systems and they're going to be thinking, okay, I, I've got the care plan, the risk assessment online. How am I going to make that really easily accessible for the, for the client? You know, are they going to be able to have their own login? You know, how are they going to be able to see it? You want to be as transparent as you possibly can. So there's all those that, that those kind of things that I would say uh, very much covers around about accessible information. Yeah, spot on. And I think the more we go digital now, the more um, we have digital solutions, our websites, our social media. It's about just making sure that they're as yeah. accessible as they possibly can be. Um, like I say, if you want to know more about accessible information standards, we do have a full episode uh, dedicated to that. It might support you at this part of your your PIR. It's only an hour long. It's usually a bit of fun. Skip the first 10 minutes. Usually Mark just waffling with myself, um, putting the world to rights. But do go check that out. Mark. Thank you very much. I think it's also worth noting that the NHS also did a big piece of work around accessible information standards. And you can find that on their website. And again, we will share the link um, as well. But there's some really detailed documents about what they kind of proposed in the NHS around font and text size and bits and pieces. So yeah, do check that out because a lot of that you're probably already doing in your services and just don't realize because it's just day to day practice. So moving on to section 2.15. What specific work have you undertaken in the past 12 months to ensure your service meets the needs of people using your service with protected characteristics? Now, going back to the CQC guidance, there were some great things on their website. We will share the link because the guidance is buried quite deep, um, far deeper for my liking than it should be. Um, but I know from the kind of manager forums and bits and pieces on Facebook, this is a real section that managers get stuck on. So Tracy, over to you for advice. Other than celebrating kind of Christmas, Eid, Easter, Pride, what other advice do you have for people on this section? I think first of all, it's it's speaking with your clients and the family members, learning, finding out as much information about the client as possible so that they get the chance to to share, you know, their different characteristics. That's number one. Um, and giving, you know, the support worker, the carer, the opportunity to see how they can um, develop, bring out these areas instead of hiding them away or, you know, uh, enabling them to celebrate if it's part of their religion, part of, you know, if they, for example, you know, if you've got a client um, and they're in a wheelchair, then I mean, this is just a off the cuff a, a, a example. I encourage the support worker to, you know, if they want to go to uh, to the mosque, you know, or, or to church on the Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. It'd take them along. You know, um, I think it's it's more finding out about the client what's what their character is what their characters are different it's it's a really hard question and i know like what you just said before most people will struggle to understand or know how to answer it so it is more about finding understanding the client and what might make them a little bit different Thank you very much. And I really think this is one of those questions where, as you said earlier, Tracy, that you need to go back to the people in your teams that are kind of on the floor working with people day in and day out, because they're really going to know actually what changes have been made. And thinking about kind of from experience, you know, it might be that you've moved somebody's bedroom, um, you've moved them from one floor to another because of mobility, you know, looking at my kind of job now, you have 
people with purpose-built equipment and bits and pieces. And you've touched on kind of the religious um, elements of care and actually making sure that people have that real preference and choice around the people that are supporting them with their, their goals and aspirations. And I think, yeah, definitely go and speak to your teams on this one because they're going to really know how you're making sure that people's needs are really being met. I think some of my tips on this as well is this is really where you need to be proactive as a service instead of reactive. So don't be thinking to yourself because, uh, say, the service that I used to manage, predominantly white area, predominantly um, affluent area, predominantly farmland area. So we knew who our immediate demographic was. Times change, communities move, communities grow and they adapt. So we've got to be proactive. So actually think to yourself, do we know what protected characteristics are? You know, print a, a guide off, a document off, make an infographic, put it within your, your services, make sure your team understand what protected characteristics are, and then put things in proactively. So put in a, um, a gender and orientation um, policy and, and guidance, you know, change your, your paperwork to already include pronouns so you're not waiting for someone to come in who uses or identifies differently. You don't want to make people feel like you're doing things for them. You want people to feel like they're included from day one. Um, so always be proactive as much. And if you haven't made any changes, be honest. But go, actually, this is triggering my mind. So I might implement this. I might implement that. I'm going to look at this and I'm going to work at this. You know, so it's just about being honest. Like we said earlier on, don't lie because they'll trip you up. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, just going back, this is where we need, uh, like you say, uh, uh, Tracy, a folder of evidence that we're keeping as we go along um, uh, throughout the th throughout the year. So 2.16 and 2.17 is really all about staffing. Um, so, you know, what have we done to make sure that uh, we've got enough equality and inclusion within our workforce and the impact that that's had? Um, and how do we ensure that we've got sufficient numbers um, to meet those that we care for now? For me, some of the tips that we should be looking at here is, especially around EDI, so equality, diversity and inclusion, have you got an audit which tells you what proportion of your workforce are female, what proportion of your workforce are male, what your ethnicity of your workforces are? Because you want to be able to demonstrate that actually you're trying to make an inclusive workforce. Your adverts, what imagery do you use? Do you use just white people and white females in your imagery? Or are you using um, multi-ethnic imagery? Are you using men in your caregiving roles? And are you using women in your leadership and management roles? It's about trying to flip the narrative and showcase how we can uh, encourage people who may not feel like they're represented in certain areas or certain sectors or certain levels within organizations and going, we are open, you can do whatever you want to. Basically, we're sorry that the world's been a mess and you've never had the opportunity, but we're giving it you now. Um, and thinking about how you can do that to promote the the EDI of your workforce. So that's that's one of the tips of mine, Mark, around EDI. What about yours? Yeah, I think that's a really good tip because I think it's something that people wouldn't necessarily think about. And again, I think that's going to be something that you might not necessarily be doing, but you could put in your PRR, PIR that it's a lesson learned. I think for me, obviously we touched on recruitment earlier and retention. I think providers have done so much around that area. They've increased the pay for staff, they've increased the benefits and actually documenting what they've done for staff and their paying conditions, but not just pay and maybe benefits they've got, but how you're supporting people with flexible working, whether they were full time and they've gone and had a child and they've come back and they're part time, you know, whether people are working four day weeks, um, whether there's a combination of people working, especially kind of obviously office staff, whether they're doing a combination of kind of working at home and in the in the service. And yeah, really deep diving into kind of the different things that you can offer your staff and also how you're keeping them safe. So, you know, looking at your risk assessments that you've got, your health and safety, and again, coming back to your team meeting agendas, and, you know, you've got that as a set kind of agenda there, but you might not, but you should be. So if you haven't, again, lesson learned that you're going to put that in your agenda going forward. Yeah, I think there's so much in this section that you really can include. Tracy, any advice from you? I everything really what you've just said there but the other part i would say more than anything which is going to be everywhere is the stress and anxiety you know as you know these number of years that everybody's gone through um i think that's another side of it as well is recognizing uh, stress anxiety um 
having that open door policy so that you know your team can come to you and be honest and say I'm you know I am really massively struggling with this you know and being able to if you can't offer it there and then on the as they stand there telling you to try and come up with a way of being able to make things easier for them put something in place you know even if it's just as a very small change um and having more contact you know it's about that open door conversation and more especially being aware of you know stress depression all that side of things um i think we've even down to and, and i'm i'm most certainly a prime example of it and it's in the media at the moment is us women in the menopause you know i was women having hot flushes and brain fog and everything like that it's it's kind of like all those areas of trying to be mindful and being able to recognize things and at the same time letting your staff know that they can come and knock on your door and say i'm having such a rotten day today you know so that's my part on that one i think there's also something to be said around all i mean all great tips and definitely around the menopause slight plug we have got an episode on that with miss menopause herself if you want to go and check that out some really great workplace tips there um, but i think there's also something around making sure that we don't use a one-size-fits-all model so please do not shout at me when you're watching this back everyone who goes but we do this offering birthdays off as an organizational wide rule is fab for those who celebrate birthdays, we have religions, we have communities where birthdays and anniversaries, we don't do, you don't do them. It's not an actual thing. So if you have someone, say, from the, the Jehovah community joining your workforce and actually one of your company perks is birthdays off, you've automatically isolated them from a company benefit. So what we need to be thinking about is actually once you apply and you're successful with us, you tell us what dates throughout the year are important to you, religiously, personally, community-wise, and we will work to make sure that you have those off. So it could be that you celebrate Kwanzaa or Diwali or, um, or Hanukkah or you know anything like that, and guaranteeing to these people that actually you can have those dates off, you can have those times off. And not just saying if you don't have kids, you're working Christmas because people who have kids need to, to have Christmas mm -hmm. off. It's about being fair and it's about having that holistic approach. Um, and there's so much when you actually sit down and think about it, you can actually go, oh, actually, yeah, I didn't realize that. You know, and it's the birthday one that does me. It's offering everyone birthdays off instantly isolates. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not saying I'm there yet, but I'm going to get to an age one day where I don't want to celebrate my birthday and I actually want to ignore it. I probably work through it to pretend I'm a year younger still. So from the EDI aspect of things, we do have how we manage our workforce numbers and how we make sure we've got enough people um, to, to do the work that we're doing. Now, I'll come from both sides. It used to be home care, it used to be residential care. I found home care a lot easier because you booked out care visits, you booked out your hours and your care hours, and you needed enough people to cover those hours, plus holidays, plus, um, you know, anticipated sick leave. So you could go, actually, I've got 500 care hours, so I probably need 700 carers hours because I've got to take into account holidays, et cetera, et cetera. And you can have a formula that may help you do it. In the care home, it's very much um, a, a case by case basis because you could have a 20 bed care home where everyone only really requires one person to support them in the system. And then four months later, half of your people living with you in your home might require the assistance of two people, which instantly increases the number of people you need to be able to provide good quality care. So it's fluid. So my tip here is really find something that you can use like a tool, develop one yourself. Um, and Mark and I might try and do it for you and, and provide something. Um, but try and look at how you do your rotors to show that you assess them fluidically uh is fluidically a word fluidly along along your journey because one month you might need 20 carries one month you might need 30 carries you need to be able to evidence that to show that you're not actually short staffed based on the demand and needs of the people you're supporting but mark you're a regional you you are a big shot regional at the moment so staffing i'm sure is is on your mind a lot of the time so how do you manage numbers yeah, I think obviously we're reablements are very similar to home care. So I think you never stop recruiting because I mean, the demand for reablement outweighs kind of what we can provide at the moment. And it always will do the same as home care. There's always going to be that demand. But I think it's about 
what recruitment processes you've got in place to make sure that actually they're safe and they meet kind of the requirements of the CQC, but also, you know, UK law. Um, I think it's about actually matching people to the skills that people need. So obviously where I am, it's obviously very kind of a lot of these healthcare tasks. So actually need to make sure that staff are upskilled in managing stomas and pegs and bits and pieces. And again, you know, if you're working in nursing, you know, your nurses will be doing this kind of thing. In learning disabilities, you're going to need to have those skilled people that can, you know, support with challenging behaviour and have that training. And I think actually when you're completing your PIR, it's looking at how you evidence that you've got staff per shift that have that knowledge and the skills. And also you take into account kind of preferences of people you know actually whether they want their personal care done by john or sandra or whoever it is and actually really homing in on that detail to actually evidence that you're meeting people's needs and i think in home care kind of touching kind of historically um, from experiences you get a lot of people that don't want a male or don't want a female and actually whether you've got that in your care plan and how often you do meet that requirement and obviously it's very hard especially with sickness and annual leave to make sure that you're doing that 100 percent of the time but just evidence in where you can what you're doing and also i think be honest like we've said throughout be transparent identify where you could be better and what you plan to do to become you know better at that particular area with your staffing tracy any any advice from you <laughs> Pretty much everything where you've really said there um you've pretty much covered uh, covered it all really so. no that's okay so we move on to section 2.18 um it's looking at what practical examples um can you give as to how you and your workforce implement and apply human rights principles so looking at fairness respect equality dignity and autonomy um to your service and the impact that this has had so again, this is a bit like one of the questions earlier, where there's a lot of questions that come up in the managers group. It's a very big, meaty question. Tracy, I'm going to dive straight over to you for advice. Oh gosh, where do you, where do you start? I'm going to bounce this one back to you because off the top, right off the top of my head, I'm going to let you go for it first, and then I can come in. So for me, I mean, this is it's, it's it's really difficult. This and it's about understanding what human rights is first. So what you want to be able to do is make sure that you can evidence how your team are fully um, apprised of what the human rights principles are, how you make sure that they're um, understanding what they are, how it underpins the work that they do on a daily basis. And um, I will go back to the pandemic, Mark, because this is something that we, you know, advocated a lot for during the pandemic, and that was the rights to visiting. You know, and it's how does the human rights aspect approach um, uh, tick you off there? You know, how are we looking at it fairly? If someone wants visits, if someone doesn't want visits, how do we make sure we meet both of their needs in the most fair way possible? How do we respect that someone doesn't want to get COVID, but that someone also wants to see their loved ones? And it's how do we implement uh, risk assessments? How do we implement organisational procedures? How do we implement staffing procedures? to meet those needs um, and again it comes down to you know your dignity your equality your autonomy on these sort of things so um wanting to make sure that people are living an independent life as possible that's absolutely fine does everybody need a pressure sensor mat in their bedroom you know they are a go-to for a lot of care providers and a lot of care providers will have them underneath every single bed or every single chair to make sure that they know when someone's up in their bedroom but it's a form of monitoring and actually, do they need that? Do their needs represent that? They need to have that level of monitoring. There's um, care softwares out there nowadays where it's so easy to build people's care plans at a click of a button. And before you know it, every single care plan looks the same. Everyone's on a fluid watch. Everyone's on a nutrition watch. Everyone's on a bowels, uh, bowel movement watch. And actually, do they need to be? You know, is that dignified for that person is that actually looking at their care plan holistically or as a sort of standard one size fits all model um simple things like knocking on the doors making sure people are just aware that that's part of your procedures is someone's home knocking the door is everything okay can i come in you know am i okay coming in um, you nip out to go and get something to to bring something to their bedrooms you do it in a dignified way you don't want to walk around the corridors holding a pad so everyone can see what you're doing you know, take a little bag out of the bedroom with you, you know, a little bedroom bag, 
And if you need to go and get something from somewhere because there's not enough storage, we all know homes aren't always fully adapted. You're doing it in a dignified way. Don't shout across the lounge. Do you need to go to the toilet? Because <laughs> is that really dignified? You know, but it's not just about, it's not good enough just to say that we don't shout across the room. Do you want to go to the toilet? What you want to be putting in this section is how you evidence how you're supporting people. So it promotes their their uh, dignity. So it promotes their autonomy and the positive impact it's had on them and the reasoning and the understanding that you've got behind it. And I think that's really what they need to look at here is, is making sure you fully understand, first off, what FAIR means um, and, and making sure you understand why you do what you do. Mark, reablement wise, obviously things are slightly different. Um, in home care wise, things are different to say residential, where the majority of my expertise are. So what would you say around this? I think absolutely you've kind of hit the nail on the head. You've raised some really great points. And I think even in home care, it's still exactly the same. And, you know, you're probably not shouting across the well, if you are shouting across somebody's lounge, it's probably just to them. But yeah, being mindful, you know, if you're looking after somebody who lives with, you know, their family or they've got grandchildren in the house, is actually making sure that their, their dignity is intact and that, you know, privacy is still such a major factor. I think it's also making sure that actually you're aware of, if that neighbour who, you know, comes in every day to support is there, that actually you're still very conscious of actually what you're saying in front of them because actually it's still information on a need-to-know basis. I think this section, I just went onto the CQC website because there's a lot I could say about the CQC, but actually when it comes to the PIR, they seem to have got it to a T now. There's so many resources on their website. Um, they do take a bit of digging around on their website to find, and quite often it's easier to kind of Google and then you have to go through the website through to the link that way. Um, but they've got, it was updated in May of this year, so not that long ago, but um, outstanding and good practice examples. Um, so they've got on this document nine examples um, that they've seen in services. So it's around committed leadership. So leaders and managers are committed to equality and human rights. And it starts at the top and it flows all the way down to the frontline staff. Um, and their work, it looks at kind of the training. And I think when we touch on training, it's good to remember actually that all our staff should be trained in equality and diversity, but also that Skills for Care have some really good resources to support in this area. Um, I think it's around commitment to improving the equality and human rights, what partnerships that you've had with people, whether that's the people that are drawing on social care, whether that's your health colleagues, whether that's commissioners and but you've got a no blame culture, but actually a learning culture and actually you want to move the service forward. You're curious about how you can learn um, and you're looking for the next kind of next thing. It's about taking positive risks. Um, and another plug for another show, we have done a show on positive risk taking, but I think especially kind of my experience, especially in learning disabilities, I think risk assessments, we are risk adverse. And I think sometimes they do really restrict people, but actually, yeah get positive risk taking, make people, you know, have a good quality of life. Back over onto the CQC website, they also did a study in 2018. But interestingly, just having a quick look, they updated it again in May of this year. Now, I'd love to know why they don't share these kind of things in their newsletters as opposed to webinars about yeah. their leadership team and bits and pieces. Because I think these are really good tools that managers would really benefit from. And why they're hidden in their website is beyond me. But They've got business cases on here. They've got economic um, cases around health and deterioration in people, legal cases. There is, yeah, we'll share these links. I'll make sure I don't shut them and we'll share these links. But there are some really good tips and tools um, to draw on on the CQC website. So I will give them that. And a lot of this might be repetitive. You know, you might sit there and go, well, actually, I, I support the autonomy of the people I support because all of my documents are click to read. So you click it and it reads out loud so they can go into their bedroom and they can sit down and listen to it themselves without someone sitting there telling them what it says. So our service satisfaction questionnaires are click to read and then easy read for them to complete themselves. That gives them the autonomy and the privacy and the dignity to do it in their own time. So that's a tick when you come to human rights, but it's also a massive tick when you come to accessible information standards. So have a look at the work you're already doing and figure out to yourself, actually, can any of that be interwoven here? 
can I use some of the stuff that I've already done and, and pull it in here and, and underpin that in the human rights aspect? So I've already I've already looked at the accessible information sort of factor of, of this piece of work, but actually this is what it means when it comes to equality and dignity, etc. Um, so don't be afraid to repeat yourself. Just make sure you're not repeating the impact. Change the impact, change the terms, change the reasoning of why you're telling them you've done what you've done. Because um, one little thing could probably cover a lot of things within... Um, the actual PIR and, and the CLOAS itself. Um, Tracy, have you got any um, final tips on that section? I do. I've, I've literally written it down as you said that. I love that click to read on your website. I think that would be, you know, if, if, if an organisation's got, um, um, you know, an intranet or something like that, that would be perfect. You know, put all, this, put all the, you know, all the policies on there and they can just click, click to read. But also as well, for, you know, families, clients as well, there's all that side of it. But the other thing I just wanted to add, because I know throughout this, uh, throughout this podcast, you're looking a lot at the look at the CQC, you know, what's on the CQC. One of the things I always suggest um, with, with um, registered managers that I work with is, you know, download the reports go and find a whole load of um reports of, of companies that are similar to yours look at the the, the the good and the outstanding ones but then look at the the other side of it and read them and you'll see a significant difference and you'll be able to pick up all sorts of bits and pieces from there it's kind of like you can use that as a way of kind of like ah so that's what the cqc is looking for it's it's stuff like that. you've got to do a bit of reading you've got to be willing to put the time in and you know properly fill these forms in it's not just about ticking and just putting the bare the bare, bare information in i really do strongly feel that if you want to get a good outstanding um you know on your inspection you've got to put the work in and do a bit of reading and you know i think that's that's a, that's another thing that i would add Thank you very much. So looking at the next part of the PIR, the questions are relatively straightforward. It looks at kind of the funding of the people that you support, how many staff um, that you've got, how many people that you support, any video monitoring that you might use and how you use them. Um, we do have an episode on video monitoring, by the way. We do. Good plug, good plug. Um, Looks at how many staff have resigned, how many staff have left for other reasons, um, how many vacancies you've got, agency hours, and that kind of brings us on to section 4.6, which is around the care certificate. Now, a quick question for you, Tracy, is, I know in my previous company, we didn't do the care certificate, um, but it was mm -hmm. encompassed, every member of staff did level two or level three, um, and it was encompassed in that QCF. Um, what would your advice be to providers that encompass the care certificate in the QCF? Because they obviously wouldn't be able to say that people have done it because they technically haven't. So it's a bit of a trick question. But... Uh, yeah, it depends what kind of organisation you are. I mean, I work an awful lot with uh, brain injury case managers. Um, and they don't all, they, I'm pretty sure not all of them go with the, you know, the, the, the care certificate. Um, it all depends, like I say, it all depends on the, the organisation that you're with. But one of the things that I will definitely say, um, I think over the last few years with um, with the pandemic, everybody's gone mad for being doing everything online. And I, I think having too much training online it is great so far, but you need to have a mix. You need to have some face-to-face -face stuff as well. And and also if, if some of the training involves it's a little bit more bespoke, so, for example, some of our brain injury case management clients, um, the support workers might need to have some one to one training with with a nurse if the person is peg fed um, or, you know, they might have a, a rehabilitation physiotherapist and they've got an exercise program. So the uh, the physio will work directly with the, the support worker to to show them so that they can continue the rehab program with them. So yeah definitely the the main qualifications but there's a lot more to it than that 
I think I'm, I'm a sucker for audits. I love audits. I mean, I, I, when I tell you, I audit my audits. So when I used to uh, be a manager, I would have a ton of audits and then I would have the audits of the audits and then I would audit my impact of the audit. So I love data. I love data. And I think what's, what's essential when it comes to training in your services is only you know what training you need. Um, so yes, yeah. there are sort of guidances out there of what training you should be doing. Only you know as a service what training is required within your organization. So what you need to do is then audit the, the work you're doing, the clientele and the people that you're supporting, figure out what training it is that you need, and then have a look at that training and then have a look at what's, what proportion of that training feasibly and effectively and to a good quality can be delivered online can be delivered um, uh, through uh, workshops, can be uh, garnered through information from um, videos such as these, where you sit down and, and you know take your information in and you can evidence the learnings from that. And then which of this sort of training do you need to really heavily invest in in-person training as well? And as long as you can get your teams to complete continual professional developments, you know, complete individual learning plans, as long as you can evidence it, to hell with the care certificate until they, you know, make it a, a requirement and, and accredit it because it puts a lot of pressure on on everybody at the end of the day what you will find though is whatever system you implement you could probably go to the care certificate and tick everything off because you can backtrack it and you know cross-reference it to the work that you're already doing just make sure you've got the evidence to back up what you're doing because they will say well if you're not doing the care certificate how do you know that actually your team understand the importance of their role and you can go well actually my team understand that because of this 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 and this and they know that because of this and this, um, et cetera, et cetera. You just need to be able to evidence it. So hard work, both sides. Just make sure you've got that evidence there to back it up. An audit. Oh, I love an audit. I might make an audit. <laughs> <laughs> it can be on that. our um, it can be on our to do list, Adam, to add an audit of an audit of an audit and say, watch this space. <laughs> go on adam no i was gonna say so we're, i mean we're what we're an hour into this now and i know how hard it is to be able to watch a podcast or listen to a podcast for x amount of time and sometimes it's easier to pause and go back i know youtube might not always do that for people so i think now's a real good time for us to go brilliant part one to this introduction of what a PIR is and um, we're not sitting here going this is what a, a you know area of the Chloe's you should be looking at because again framework and everything's up in the air at the moment this is just a basic here's your sort of introduction to the PIR have you considered this have you considered that thought you know provoking mind jogging jump starting sort of podcast to, to really help you along the routes we know not everyone listening to this will be a residential home not everyone listening to this will be a, a home care service we will have nursing homes we'll have supported living we'll have extra housing and um, heck we may have dentists we may have gp surgeries we may have hospitals you know but we are predominantly social care focused on this so again this is just an introduction to it this will be part one of uh, this episode with Tracy Clark, um, and we will be back for a part two. Um, we'll put them both up together, and we're just going to make it for, for ease of viewing for you. Um, so, Tracy, for part one, thank you so much um, for joining us. Um, Mark, any final words before we disappear and prepare for part two? I think for me, it's just be completely open, be transparent. Mm -hmm. Like Tracy said earlier, utilize your team around you, utilize any deputies, your seniors, the frontline care workers, your domestic staff, your cooks, utilize everybody, you know. And the only thing I would say is obviously it is a web link. So be careful who you share that link with, because if there's multiple people in that link at the same time, it won't save. Um, so I would definitely recommend doing it on a Word document so you can copy and paste it in. Um, just so that you don't lose any hard work, especially if you haven't got a hard copy. But no, I think it's been a, an amazing first session and I've I've been writing lots of notes. Um, and I hope, yeah, we should have reminded people to bring a notepad. So we'll make sure we do that in section two. So yeah, thank you. Tracy, any final words before we prepare for section two of this? I think it's been a really good session. Some really great questions on there. Um, and here, I mean, some of the topics you could spend a whole session on, like which you guys have already done. Um, I, I think it's, I, I can't say enough, it, you know, 
registered managers they've got such a mass massive responsibility they can't work in silo they need to you know work with the team they need to involve people it's like you know having you're know, a champion you could have you know nominate one of your team members to be the gdpr champion it's 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 bringing everybody together and it it's great for building momentum and kind of you know involving everybody everybody can feel as though they've got a little bit to share it's it's just a good way of running a business Thank you so much, Tracy. Well, we will be back for part two. Um, I mean, we're going to really focus on the commissioners and partnership side of things in part two, as well as quality assurance and risk management. Yes, that does mean more audits, and I do love them. Um, and obviously, the the favourite question of everyone else is anything else, which, you know, isn't really a required. So everyone's really tempted to skip past it. I'm going to say don't. There's a lot we can put in anything else. Um, and I think what we'll also do is we'll have a look at how the, the PIR for the community differs from the residential, just to bring in some of those aspects for you as well. Um, but I think until then, thank you so much for joining us. If you have enjoyed this, do give us a subscribe, follow us on our social medias and our podcast, and we will be back with you for our PIR part two. See you later, everyone. Bye. <laughs>